everybody can hear us all right. Um, I am, uh, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and do an introduction here. I'm Steve Carlson with Practical Farmers of Iowa. Uh, I'm going to be the, the, the host, I guess, for tonight's Farminar and, and all the Farminars coming up this fall season. So um, I put my email address in the chat box there if you ever want to get a hold of me. Feel free to reach out. Um, and like I said in there, uh, feel free to let us know where you're tuning in from. I'm here at the Practical Farmers of Iowa office in Ames, Iowa. And uh, like I said, if you want to join our Farm and Our Updates list, let me know your email address and I'll, I'll give you a weekly reminder about what topic is coming up uh, for these Farm and Ours. Uh, another thing on that bottom left corner of the screen here is a little poll, and that just helps us kind of keep track of how many people are tuning in. So if you want to check the right box with how many people are, are at you watching this Farm and Our tonight, that, that helps us get an accurate head count with who's tuning in here. So as you're aware, we've got Jim and Leanne Vanderpoel of Pastures Aplenty in uh, kind of central western Minnesota here tonight. They're going to be uh, starting things off. And they raise organic crops, hogs, and cattle, and, and they're in the process of transferring management and ownership of their farm and farm business to their children. And the Vanderpoels have been very open about sharing you know, information about their farm. And in the past, we've had them speak at our annual conference on a couple of things, multi-species grazing and niche pork, and, and now more recently they've been um, happy to share their experience with farm transfer, which is the topic for tonight. And joining the Vanderpoels, we've got attorney Rachel Dahl, who uh, grew up on a farm herself and now specializes in farm transition planning and navigating all of the legal aspects that surround that, that um, big process. So we'll have uh, Jim and Leanne speak for about 30 minutes with their, you know, insight and in the farm transfer process and their family. And then Rachel will give some tips from her attorney perspective for about another 30 minutes. And we'll save that final 8 to 8.30 time period or so for, for Q&A. But real quick, I'm going to say a few things about Practical Farmers of Iowa. So here is our fall farm in our series after tonight. We've got six topics planned until about the Christmas time. Um, so definitely mark your calendars to tune back in at 7 p.m. next week or the week after. And if you do miss one, uh, we record these and we put them uh, on our website in our Farm and Our Archives. So there's a link there to that if you want to go look through the archived recordings. We've been doing these since 2009, and we've got more than 130 of these recorded webinars on our website. So if you've got some topic that you're curious about, there's a good chance we've got a Farm and Our in the archive about it. So check that out. So Practical Farmers of Iowa uh, has been around now for over 30 years, and we are a member-based, farmer-led organization. Uh, we consider ourselves to be kind of a big tent. We welcome everyone, um, all kinds of farming enterprises, and um, farmers from all farm sizes. So uh, we provide programming, like, like you might have noticed in our farm and our topics, um, for all kinds of enterprises, with livestock and row crops and horticulture and and everything in between. So we are proud to be a diverse organization. And our mission at PFI is strengthening farms and communities through farmer-led investigation and information sharing. And we do that to help farmers practice an agriculture that benefits both the land and the people. So we accomplish that mission in a variety of ways. Um, first of all, one of our um, oldest practices here at Practical Farmers of Iowa is on-farm research in what we call our cooperators program, which helps farmers design and implement replicated on-farm research trials on whatever topics they're curious about on their farm. And then we help uh, farmers share their experiences, whether it be from the on-farm research results or, like tonight, farmland transfer. We help, we help farmers share their experiences through uh, on-farm field days, through workshops, in these farminars. And, and then also at our annual conference. And so we just put out our annual conference brochure, and uh, we want you to go and check that out on our website. Um, this year, it's going to be on January 19th and 20th. Our conference is always in Ames on the ISU campus. And um, this theme, the theme this year for our annual conference is revival, where we want to help people work toward repopulating rural communities and rejuvenating Iowa's soil, uh, regenerating creeks and rivers. So um, definitely check out all the content that we've got for our conference and make sure to get registered for that and join us in Ames January 18, 19, and 20. 
another upcoming event I wanted to highlight real quick is our beginning farmer retreat which is just in a couple of weeks so if you or someone you know is a beginning or an aspiring farmer uh, this year it's going to be December 1 and 2 in Indianola and it's a great opportunity for networking and to make progress building or improving your farm business so again look look up more information about that on our website and so if you like what Practical Farmers does please join us we're a member based organization and we welcome everyone uh, there are a number of member benefits but but really the benefit of Practical Farmers is is joining a network of people who want to see sustainable agriculture put on the landscape and and people who are willing to help each other improve profitability and efficiency and improve their stewardship so it's really tapping into that network of other of other like-minded people and you don't have to be from Iowa we have members like the Vanderpoles up in Minnesota and all over the Midwest and even much farther than that too so um, definitely join our network if you like what we do and then finally a couple of rules um, feel free to put your questions in the chat box for our speakers uh, try and keep the questions focused on the topic and um, and if our speakers you know see your question as they come in they might go ahead and give you an answer but otherwise I'll help them uh, circle back and make sure that your questions get answered once we come to that Q&A time around around 8 p.m. so feel free to pop them in the chat box whenever they come up but um, we'll get to them eventually and another thing is that um, as a farmer-led organization your feedback for us is is really important so we ask that you fill out a quick survey it's just a very you know quick one minute survey and let us know what you thought about tonight's presentation and on that survey is also an opportunity to tell me what topics you want to hear about in the future so I'm actually planning our winter farming our topics right now so um, get your suggestions in there and, and we definitely take that feedback seriously so this link to the uh, survey on the screen here does work if you wanted to click that it would probably open your web browser right now and then you can set that aside till after the presentation and fill it out otherwise I'll put that link in the chat box um, a little bit later but do do take that survey before logging out tonight I really appreciate that um, so that's it for me and right now I am going to get out of the way and I'm going to pull up Jim and Leanne Vanderpool's presentation and, and Jim and Leanne when you see that pop up on your screen here then you feel free to go right ahead. Thanks everybody for tuning in. Okay, uh, now I'm assuming the microphone is on. This is Jim. I wanted to say uh, two things. One is that uh, the uh, the uh, PowerPoint or whatever that you're going to be looking at is put together by Leanne, who's sitting here by my side. Uh, she does all of this kind of thing. I help a little, a little bit with some of the wording sometimes, with the pictures and the layout and the order things should come in is all her creation. So the other thing I, I thought uh, we should say is that the first two slides here are a lot about people. And that's deliberate yeah. uh, because uh, because we feel that, like any other uh, really very important um, uh, uh, human thing that we do, uh, passing on a farm or, or trying to transition a business is, is about what's best for the people that uh, that are involved in it and, and that surround them. So. Yeah, and this first picture is um, of Jim's dad holding our son. We came home to the farm to visit when he was maybe a month old, and um, he was out of the field <laughs> by the table. Yeah. And then um, the picture in the left corner is Jim's mom as a young woman, and they were farmers all their lives. Yeah, they were. And then the other picture is of Jim um, going out when we had sheep, and our two oldest grandsons when they were little. Right, and if you look at that picture, you can see kind of the aspect of our land here. We're we're fairly flat. There's uh, there's a little roll to it here and there, but it's it's nothing all that uh, all that significant. So I, I could say for the benefit of of the of the of the, of the web of the farminar the webinar here, we talked with Rachel a little bit earlier about this that um, uh, my dad uh, did not have a farm to inherit in his uh, family and and. Uh, uh, and my mother, uh, her family owned uh, 480 acres going into the Depression. 
in the Dust Bowl and came out of it uh, just barely hanging on to 160 of it. So um, that that's kind of uh, the farming background here, and they got, and they did uh, uh, get together and managed to get themselves viable in in farming, which was possible to do, but not easy. It's never been easy, and and they did it. So. Um, so yeah, so that's what you're looking at there. Um, now, in the next one, are we going to go to the next one now? Let's see now. How do Got to go there. Yeah. How do I? Oh, next. Click that. Yeah. Yeah. There. there we go. Yeah. Okay. So here's some more of the more current people. Um, the picture of us uh, in front of the hoop. That's a hog feeding hoop there. Uh, on the right is our two grandsons that are on the farm with us. Uh, then our daughter-in-law, and then our granddaughter that's on the farm. And there's our son, kind of in the middle. Uh, a little over toward the left, and Leanne and I are standing on the left side there. Um, uh, the uh, picture on the upper right is my sister, Terry, who is uh, an LSP, Land Stewardship Project Organizer, and she's involved in the farming with us as well. So uh, uh, she uh, owns half of the brood, or stock cow herd and, uh, and gets involved with that, uh, that side of the production. And then the, uh, the picture in the lower uh, right is our family uh, complete, I guess, except that it's a little old and then we have one more granddaughter. No, no, she's on there too. Yes, that's what our family looks like now. Leanne's uh, and my children, uh, three of them, and their offspring. So um, I mean, we're not going to name them all, but that's... Eight grandchildren. That's, uh, that's what... This is kind of a kind of a view of what our farm and our farming looks like. Um, I don't know how many of you listening in might know a thing or two about pigs, but you can recognize those sows in the lower third or in the in the lower uh, right hand uh, uh, picture there as being a little bit on the old fashioned side. Uh, they are uh, uh, they're uh, uh, not uh, not as long as a modern pig exactly. Uh, they carry a little more girth than uh, the structure is. Uh, I could go on and on about this, but I better not. Uh, the, the structure is, to me, correct as an old-time hog man. Uh, and, and the structure of the modern pig is not. The modern pig needs an extra set of legs under its middle, in my view. Um, and that's, uh, that has a lot to do with the taste of our, of our pork. And up, up above, you can see a picture of our pens. Uh, we farrow on straw in a central farrowing house. Uh, uh, no slats, and uh, there's a gutter cleaner behind there that we use. Uh, those are probably a day old pig, uh, litter a day old pigs there, most likely. We installed so. geothermal underneath uh, the cement for cooling for the summertime. Yes. And then this picture on the right, upper right, um, we put up solar panels. Uh, they just were completed last November, so that we've had them for a year. And they just run our meats building. Two, two walk-in freezers. Two walk-in freezers, computers, yeah. the lights, and yeah. so forth. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And um, uh, uh, I should say that uh, uh, oh, I lost my thought. Let's go on to the next thing, whatever it is. There's a picture of our meat, I guess. Here we go. Discussion with family members. Communication, communication, communication. And that's never done. Uh, and we work at it still uh, because... Um, Anytime large sums of money are flying around all over the place and land is being talked about, there's uh, a lot of possibility for hurt and upset. Even when you think you have things put together as best you can, I think it's best not to assume that it's going to necessarily stay that way. You've got to stay on top of it. And that is Leanne's uh, uh, thought there. Our goal is to bind family together rather than tear apart. And we want to talk a little bit about how we've tried to do that in this, or are we going to do that later? Probably later. Probably later. Okay, next slide then. Okay, this is a little bit about our history. Um, our son Josh and daughter-in-law Cindy started farming with us in the late 90s. And um, those, um, we hit some rough times in 1998 with hog, the hog market. So just when they started with us, things got difficult. Yes. As they always do on a farm, it seems like you have these ups and downs. So we gave Josh one half the hog operation over several years. Yeah, and that, and, and that I, I want to add in there. That was in 
in in return for what he didn't earn when times when times were so hard that there was really not enough money to go around and and they did without a lot yeah. and, and well we did too but we had more backing because we were older they so, also during that time were um, working with Cindy's family uh, who had a floral and um, greenhouse business Uh, 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 so yeah, um, I don't know. I think that's maybe about it. There, there. Now, here's some of the legal stuff. Should we uh, do this? Talk about this in the order that it occurred, really, kind of. In 1998, when we ended up giving our hogs away, that's what I think of it as being. Anyhow, they were eight cents a pound, and we figured a market in figured out a market in St. Paul with the Hmong people there, admirable people, by the way. If you ever get a chance to have anything to do with the Hmong, you, you need to take the opportunity. They're they're tough and they're and they're uh, uh, just just extremely admirable people. Anyhow, uh, they were buying lightweight hogs, and so we were able to sell the hogs to them to get the feed bill stopped. It's not that we made any money on the hogs, but it was better than going out and shooting them. We thought, which was the better, which was the only other really uh, option to do. So when we lost. Uh, uh, we lost, I don't know what we lost, maybe 30 or 40 percent of our equity, including equity in the land, uh, in that washout. Then we decided that we weren't going to be producing hogs anymore unless we could keep control of them all the way to, to market. And market for us means to the people that would actually buy and eat the pork. So to that end, we formed Pastures of Plenty Company. The S Corporation was formed in, in 2000, and, uh, and we have... Uh, uh, each 25% of that, each of the adults. Uh, our son has 25, our daughter-in-law 25, and each of us has 25%. And that was formed first. And we had talked about doing our own marketing, and this, this kind of forced us into really looking at it more closely. Yeah, and I honestly didn't think it would work, but I was wrong about that because it did work. And, so, well, it took a good five years. Yeah, it sure did. The first five years were a struggle. Yeah. Um, um, one of us would say, oh, maybe we should just quit. And, and then the other one would say, well, let's try it a little longer. So we, we kept each other going by somebody being encouraged. Yeah, somebody was up uh, most of the time. <laughs> and uh, we needed that. Okay, to go up on that slide then, the farming partnership. Now remember, the farm is a separate uh, entity. It's a separate accounting entity. It doesn't belong to Pastures of Plenty Company. But what we were doing is running it basically as a sole proprietorship is the way Leanne and I ran it. And we were just sharing it back and forth. We each would make out, out a Schedule F, each family, and here, you take that, and I'll take that, this, that time, and you can have that income and expense, and et cetera, et cetera. And the accountant said, you guys got to quit doing this. It's a red flag to the IRS. So we did quit doing that. It wasn't very big dollars in any case. But that, that's when we formed up the uh, Pastures of Plenty Farm LLP. And, and that's what owns and operates the farm. It, it owns all of the machinery. It owns all of the livestock. It owns all of the grain and feed and storage. And it's responsible for all of the operating debt. Not the land, but all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. So, should we go on to another one? Yeah. Yeah, coming up with a plan takes lots of work. Lots of fighting <laughs> we too. We've been at it. We were, we were at it a lot of years. We were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But so, it's it's good to allow plenty of time to do the plan. Yeah. Just assume that it's going to take you plenty of time because it will. Uh, uh, we we may have thought we were going to get it done in one year, but it kind of stretched out toward ten. I think. Yeah. Well, everybody has their own ideas how it should all go, and so you got to work through all those. Yeah. Those knots. And that last thing there, no plan is not a good option because then you're letting somebody else decide. Yeah, and then your children have to really deal with it at the end. And yeah. mm -hmm. It can be a real mess just for families. Yeah, there's a shot, a couple of shots of our farm. Uh, at the bottom, the bottom picture is our granddaughter. She's quite a bit older than that now. She's a senior in high school. Um, but she's uh, uh, lugging around on a piglet out there in the, uh, in the, in the pasture farrowing at that time. Uh, the upper right is our little uh, um, grandnephew, I guess he is, huh? Mm -hmm. Gideon, the philosopher king, we call him, because he, 
he likes to stand with his arms behind his back like that. Um, so anyway, so we grew the meat sales company, and that was hard to keep up with for quite a while. It started, it really started to take hold in 1999 and really 2000, and then it was really, it really boomed in terms of. Uh, we're talking, I don't know, what should we say, 20 or 30% increases in, in gross income per year, all the way through until about, oh, I don't know, 2014, and then it started to stabilize and, and, and get more stable and steady and slow. We certified the land organic in 1995, and the reason we did that is because one of our businesses at that time was grazing dairy heifers for an organic dairy, and uh, and he wanted us to... Uh, 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 to uh, have organic pastures, and so we certified the land organic to take them up on that. Um, that was uh, Cedar Summit. Cedar Summit Cedar Dairy, Summit ex 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 which if supplied you, bottled milk into the Twin Cities yeah, for some if any years. of you are familiar with Cedar yeah. Summit. Mm -hmm. Yep, and so then uh, uh, the uh, the company or the meat sales started to uh, uh, started to uh, uh, to uh, run certain things about the farm, and we left pasture farrowing and built central farrowing facilities. And there were two reasons for that. The main one being that our markets wanted uh, pork on a regular basis. And you can't farrow once in April and once in October and uh, supply pork on a regular basis. That yeah. doesn't work. Yeah, we started selling to stores, and they need right. a supply yep. every week. Yep. Um, uh, so... so uh, uh, so, and the, the other reason then was because our farm is a, a low, uh, uh, the aspect of the land is low, it's, it's uh, very fertile but very poorly drained, internal drainage in the soil, and it was difficult a lot of times to have heavy sows out there. And that's really become true in the last two or three years with the change in, in, in weather and climate that we're seeing. So, uh, after the Cedar Summit uh, uh, dairy took, uh, or brought the last heifers over here uh, some, I don't know, five years ago, I suppose it was now, or four. Then we started with grass-fed beef. We had a few beef animals around, and we just uh, started to expand on that. So, What we are trying to accomplish in our transition, that's our oldest grandson, by the way, and that's my hand. That's my Claim to fame, my, my hand on a kid's head. <laughs> so, yeah, that's the oldest one. That's the oldest okay. one, yeah. Okay, um, we have, um, well, the goals that we thought of. Um, we want to be fair to all our, our children, and we want to provide for our, our own retirement, and it's important to us that our the farm continues on. That's yours. <laughs> yeah, I thought we needed one joke. So, so it's a joke. So. Yeah, uh, diversified retirement portfolio. Yeah. Forty percent in bones, thirty percent in squeaky toys, and thirty percent in stuff I stole from the cat. <laughs> okay, so what we tried to look at is is different ways uh, of different uh, uh, devised by different kinds of people and kinds of farms. Uh, as, as far as uh, passing on uh, a farm. And one thing we looked at was share milking, which is something that I don't understand very well because we never did milk cows. I did when I was a kid, but uh, we never milked cows here on our farm. But we looked at that, the idea of, of you know, using, uh, using your labor to buy or to, uh, to, uh, to get for yourself some of the income of the farm, which on a dairy farm is milk. And, and then uh, and then building that into ownership of cows, and then maybe eventually being able to build the ownership of cows into ownership of land, and and we tried to do some of those kinds of things uh, uh, with the uh, with the hogs, and with our situation, uh, it doesn't track very closely. But we were trying to follow that idea that you use your labor, uh, you know, to uh, to be able to buy a share of. Uh, Farms produce or farm farms income, and then and then you build on that. So that's that's how we try to do that. And then listed below there, you can see some of the things that we looked at. Yeah, we 
we try and go to a fair amount of um, conferences in the winter time, and um, so we connect with other other farmers and what they're trying trying to uh, how they're trying to transition their farms to other to the next generation. Yeah. Um, and so we'll we'll get into these last couple of items here in the coming slides. I think is that the fair yeah, way to say it. And um, with yeah, and we also tried to um, explore a lot of different. Sources of yeah. information, yeah, mm -hmm. um, yeah, which sometimes can be very confusing. Very, too. It is very confusing. Yes. Okay, so just to review, the uh, farming LLP owns and finances all farm operations. The S corporation buys the animals from the farm, pays for the processing of them, and then sells the meat. So it, it runs as a separate corporation. Yeah, and and there's a, several reasons why we have those as two different entities. Um, the bookkeeping, then we can see um, how each thing is is uh, uh, doing doing, and um, and also um, uh, liability. Um, it, uh, the farm is separate from the S corporation. We carry insurance for the S corporation for as life, well. Yeah. As well, mm -hmm. um, and and all land is is privately held and rented to the operating company, or which is the partnership, the LLP on yeah. the top. And I think so, we get into this a little in another slide. Yeah, and we uh, at, at one time, well, last year, Jim's sisters, uh, two of his sisters, owned some of the land, and we rented from. Yeah, them. we do get the uh, another yeah. co coming slide, and we've got to make sure we don't interfere with Rachel. Yeah. Here. So go, we'll go on to the next slide, I think. Okay, this is the this is the slide. Yeah. So uh, our farm is 320 acres, which is small, and it wouldn't operate at all, I don't think, if we weren't marketing and uh, and grazing uh, adds another uh, big aspect of it too on some of the, especially on some of the more difficult acres. But what we did is is that when we settled uh, my parents' estate, we had we asked uh, my two sisters to own 80 acres of it for a while. Uh, and, and so that we didn't have to take on that tremendous head of debt because uh, we didn't think we could, we thought we'd stagger under that, especially with trying to start uh, start a, a, a children in the business. So they did, they, um, they held 80 acres and, and what we've now done is that of the, uh, uh, of the acres that we have uh, in our name, which is 232, we gifted 80 acres to Josh. Um, he can use that and did use that then uh, to go ahead and uh, and and uh, offer to his aunts uh, uh, to buy their land and has in, in fact bought it. So he's there. They own they own a quarter section now, which is uh, 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 and we own a quarter and then some um, land of Leans and Renville County. So uh, so we gave up a fair amount of land. But what we did, it's not so much our thinking was. Not so much that we're going to give Josh something that we didn't give the girls, but that we're going to give it to him earlier so he gets the advantage of it. Because so much in farming is trying to build up a head of equity so that you can do things as you go. And, and uh, so our, our gifting those acres early uh, to him, uh, plus the fact that we're, we're working on, uh, uh, on, on, the, uh, on the farm operations ourselves, and, and that's a benefit to him, that's kind of our head start. Trying to trying to get uh, into his hands, so um, then the remainder of land goes into life estate for the children. Life estate in Minnesota is kind of damaged. Uh, we're aware of that, and I'm sure Rachel will probably be able to speak to that. But it, we think that it functions well enough so, so that we're using it. So okay, the LLP the. Uh, we started out 50-50 in the partnership, and uh, now we've gone to 60-40. And and that and that's in in that's in. See, that's the other thing I, I didn't mention about giving giving a, a farming child a head start. When we started, we bought my dad's machinery at a decent price, but we ended up paying it for it for the next 25 years, which is a little bit like paying for a dead horse. And, and I thought that we should try to avoid doing that. We should, we should try to look at breeding livestock and, and, um, and farm machinery as, as assets that you need to own in order to generate income. 
and, and they, they have to do with the farm, not personal wealth. So since we have both the, the machinery and the machine debt and the breeding livestock and whatever debt they carry uh, due to having bought bulls and boars and whatnot, uh, that's all in the ownership of the farming LLP. When, when we started it at 50-50 and, and we've dropped now down to 40% ownership our share, we need to remember, and you need to remember, that's not a clear asset that we're giving because we're giving debt over as well. It's just a matter of changing of the generations, basically. Um, now, the meat company ownership is equally split between our farms, and we have not established a transition for that meat company yet. Yeah, right now we have all of, all of our children inheriting. Right. And we'll, we'll have to revisit that. And we were at the last Practical Farmers of Iowa um, conference. Um, Dan Wilson said, made this statement, and I, it just really struck me. So I added it to the presentation. Yeah, and that picture, that, that's, our, that's our grandson in another family, and our daughter Katie's family, the oldest of hers. And you know, or anybody that has to deal with cattle knows that when you when you're when the cattle are used to you feed, uh, showing up every day or every third day or whatever or with a tractor or whatever you do to feed them in the winter time they look for one if you come out there with two or three people they start getting really squirrely and tanner was wondering why he couldn't get close to the cattle so i said just stand still and wait and see if they come to you and that's what's happening here the cattle are coming to tanner That's a little bit of what our farm looks like. Um, it doesn't always look that good, but it depends on if we're yeah. hauling manure or not, <laughs> you know. Uh, I did want to say um, uh, before we sign off, or we're not going to sign off, but before we end our, our presentation, uh, this business in the third or fourth slide that we had uh, about trying to bind people together, some of what we've done with with the land uh, and the and 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 I think we'll probably try to do with the business is to do that uh, to accomplish that in a couple of ways. Once one, we we want our son to fully understand that he needs to be uh, be considering his sisters and 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 uh, and and taking them on uh, if not as financial partners and not I think as financial partners, but as as partners in, in, in trying to uh, trying to manage and and, uh, and keep the farm going in the future, and we had our uh, we we made plain to our daughters that it was important to us that that we 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 wanted to be fair. That doesn't necessarily mean equal, but fair is fair, and and it was important to us that the farm has a, a voice too, that the farm uh, that that the farm speaks too in a sense that the farm go on. And, and so, and say, so they know how very strongly we feel that that uh, that all three of them need to do what they can decently do uh, to keep the farm going on. And and so that's how we've tried to bind them together. That's fair to say, isn't it? That's pretty much what yeah. we did. Yes. And and still do. Now, if you look at those pictures that are up on the screen, you can see that basically we knocked down an old Quonset shed uh, up there that was Dad's cattle feeding shed. Uh, in the top picture, top left there, you can also see a hog hoop house in that same picture. Um, but, but we knocked that Quonset shed down and we put a modern farrowing house and connected it to the barn. So that's, and then of course the seasons are different. But, so, and, anyway, the, and the bushes have grown. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The lower picture, the right hand picture is a more modern one. So, And I think uh, with that, I think we'll turn our microphone off for Rachel's uh, thoughts. Does that sound right? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Jim and Leanne. And actually, maybe maybe keep your mic on for just a moment while I transition slides. There are a couple of questions um, that you can answer maybe in the meantime here. So Carl asked in the chat box there about your uh, uh, he asked about your S corporation and um, is, is there is there anything you can add about you know you know the the reason that you went with an S corp? I know there are other options and. Uh, yeah, any background on that? I think we went with an escort because our lawyer suggested it, um, and so we went with it. Was there more reason than that? 
I, I think that that's really all that went into that. We knew that we needed some sort of a structure between the farmland and 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 the customers, uh, um, you know, so that we we would try to protect the farmland a little bit in case of a problem, which knock on wood we've never had, and I hope we never do. Um, mm -hmm. Try to put out a you know first rate product, and and so far that's carried the day for us. But sure. But the, uh, the, but the idea of a corporation, an S corporation, is simpler than a C corp. Uh, it, it basically it drains the uh, the uh, the income uh, of the corporation goes down to the uh, the 1040 of the owners of the corporation, and uh, and and so it's it's kind of it's about it's it's very simple uh, uh, accounting and and and, uh, and bookkeeping, and and yet it's a corporate structure. So I think that's probably the reason why we yeah. chose an S corp. Yeah. Yep, that's good. And Carl, if you have uh, further questions about that, I'm sure actually Rachel can probably address those as well. Um, so let's see, there was another one that I wanted to ask you, Jim and Leanne. Um, and then, yeah, when you were talking about um, gifting the land, uh, are there tax considerations? McGillicuddy was asking, what, what are the tax considerations of gifting that land? Uh, the, the land uh, uh, will we'll have to, there had to, there, we needed to file a gift tax return, and that gets added to, subtracted from, whatever, however you want to think of it. Uh, to our estate uh, or subtracted from our estate and the exemption for both uh, the state and the federal certainly is high enough so that that's not a problem. In other words, we're not going to have a problem with estate taxes under the current structure and all, all we did is, is, is uh, basically by this uh, gifting like that and filing a gift tax return is saying that we're going to you know, these kids are going to get this land and we're just doing it in this case a little early. So it, 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 it gets calculated in with what our estate would have been if we had kept the land. Uh, and, and, it, and it's no tax issue for us because, uh, because we're not, we're not uh, uh, wealthy enough to be vulnerable, I guess is what you would say. So. Yeah, okay, great. Um, and, and one more final question, I guess, before we move on. It looks like McGillicuddy asked in here, and this might be tough to answer in just one uh, minute, but what if some of the kids are totally uninterested or, or even antagonistic to the farming operation? And I know you've got two children who are not farming with you, so maybe you have some insight there. Um, I, we don't have any kids that are uh, antagonistic to the farming operation. Our girls... Are, are, are believers that they want the farm to continue. Uh, very strong believers mm -hmm. in that. Um, I, you know, it, it might be different if we had said to them, look, you're not going to get any inheritance at all. There's nothing for you because your brother gets all of it. That might have changed something. But in fact, we didn't say that. Uh, we're, we're, we're ending up giving them, we will end up giving them by will, if the life estate holds, uh, you know, on, on final expenses, uh, just as much as their brother is getting, but they're going to get it later. And, and they understand how much we wanted the farm to continue, and they're honoring that. And, and I think that they uh, they believe in it themselves. They um, they also um, uh, are interested in our meat business, and um, uh, we have a son-in-law that's our, uh, a graphic designer and a daughter that's an artist, uh, the other daughter. Um, so they contribute sometimes to. Um, um, Creating flyers and business cards and yes, and and, 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 and and things like that. And I think we can say without getting any further into things than we should, because you know your children. You know, after having raised them, you you got an idea uh, about their strong points and their weak points. And uh, our our daughters are uh, are apt to be in the future, uh, and even are now, due to the like the graphic designing too, for example, in the art. Uh, str uh, strong assets to the meats business in terms of the fact that they're communicators. And I don't think there's anything in the kind of meat business we're running that's more important than communication. You, you have to stay in touch with customers and make sure you understand what they think is important and make sure that, uh, that the customers understand some of what it takes you to do what you're doing. Uh, that takes communicators, and both of our daughters are communicators. Excellent. Yes. Thank you for uh, sharing that. 
Um, so, right. Rachel, now I think we're probably ready for you. And yeah, Vanderpolz, if you don't mind sticking around for some questions a little bit later. Um, Rachel, we, I started us a little bit late, so you feel free to go up until, you know, about maybe 10 after or so. Okay. Can everybody hear me okay? Sounds great. Okay, perfect. Just want to make sure that after I unmuted this, everything worked. Um, okay, well, thank you for having me. I, uh, I really appreciate being able to participate in this seminar. And um, feel free to type your questions in. Um, and if there's something that, uh, you know, even those questions that have been asked already, if you'd like any further uh, insight on, I'm, I'm happy to do that. So uh, please feel free to do that. Um, this is a topic that is very near and dear to my heart, both personally and professionally. Um, I'm a former farm kid, and I practice in this area. And this topic is just such a big topic um, these days. And you know, first and foremost, when we look at why are these things important, um, and when we look at the census information, Right now, we have really what continues to be a 30-year trend, and, it, and it, the age of uh, the average farmer continues to increase. And so we have a lot of folks out there that are looking for uh, answers and solutions on how to transfer their, their farm to that next generation, um, and particularly for a lot of people in a way that has meaning for them. And that meaning can be defined in, in many different ways. Uh, it's a very individual thing. but um, we know there's a lot of farm, uh, you know, farms out there. We've got an increasing average age, and we also have stats that tell us that the majority of farmers have been on their current farm for 10 years or more. Um, and while we see that land prices fluctuate greatly over time, um, we had a big spike about 2012-2013. Things have have started coming back down, but What's particularly difficult for young and beginning farmers is that that land price is still pretty high. And so there really is a struggle for that next generation who has an interest in getting into farming to be able to do so um, you know, with, without essentially putting everything they've got into it, even if it's a family farm. And what I hear from, from people commonly is, if if mom and dad are on the farm and there is a uh, quote unquote on farm air, you know there there has to be creative solutions to be able to keep this farm in the family uh, in a way that you know maybe doesn't require that on farm air to go out and essentially mortgage everything to the hilt, or in some cases buy the farm twice. Meaning you know now they're in a position where. They, they started working and putting sweat equity into the farm, and the off-farm heirs uh, have an expectation that even though they may not uh, be in line to farm that land uh, or, or you know, work that business, um, they may have an expectation that they will receive some monetary compensation when mom and dad pass. And so this is just becoming increasingly important uh, in our conversations. And... Really, the general stats on business transitions, the, the odds of a business surviving into second, third, and fourth generations, particularly without you know, transition planning, uh, they're not great odds. Um, they're pretty dismal. And so you know, right now, what I see is that this planning is critical to, to have a successful transition of this family farm, keep that in the family, if that's desired. Uh, and the other thing I'm seeing is that absentee land ownership is up. Uh, when I look at some of the stats coming in from uh, some of the brokers who are out there selling farms and farmland, uh, commonly it's going to be an estate or trust that is the seller. And we've got uh, an expansion farmer um, potentially, or we've got uh, an, an investor uh, who is purchasing that land. Um, and, and land is usually a pretty safe bet for investment purposes, but um, for, for those families that are really looking to find solutions um, to keep that, that family farm in the family, now is the time to really take a look at it and consider what they might do. Um, major concepts in this process 
And I heard Jim uh, and Leanne say this in their portion of tonight's farminar. This is something that takes time. And it's not an overnight process. You know, you don't plant one day and the very next day go out to harvest. Um, we know that there's a process involved and it is always better to start early. You will have far more options at your disposal if you do so and <clears throat> it, can, it can oftentimes be difficult to start um, but understand that it is not an overnight process and furthermore there is not any one-size-fits-all solution. So no one method is going to work for every family and that's okay. You need to consider your family, your family's needs, and what's going to be best in your situation. Um, you know, Jim and Leanne mentioned a few different methods that they've employed. That's great. That works for them. That may not be what works for someone else. And again, understand that's okay um, because there are a lot of options. And I think sometimes what happens is people get into... Um, the, the planning and so much is thrown at them, so many options are available and we kind of lose sight of where we're going and, and it's easy to become frustrated and really halt the process. And, you know, I, I heard Jim say this, that, you know, failing to plan is, is planning to fail and that's absolutely correct. You know, this is something that does take some, some active work. Um, but essentially, the best place to start I would say is for mom and dad to sit down and start defining what their goals are and what their needs are very early in this process. And that can just be sitting at the kitchen table and asking questions of each other about what, if you look forward into the future, what is the ideal outcome for this farm and for the family? And knowing who your kids are and what they're capable of um, and what your situation is is going to be really critical. Um, family dynamics should be considered, um, your assets, your holdings should be considered and frankly it also needs to be, you also need to take into consideration personally for mom and dad, you know, what does retirement look like? You know, what, what, what does that life look like? Are there sufficient means where if mom and dad exit the farming business they will have a comfortable life in retirement that that they've worked for so so the the goals and the needs really of mom and dad first and foremost have to have to be hashed out and you know think of it um then starting to look at you know more of those those family dynamics and the issues and understand that this has to be reassessed from time to time because life changes, um, the values of assets change, the law changes. So know that when you get into this process, even if you have documents that are signed and you think you're set, this really does take continued work on uh, the part of the farm family to keep uh, these goals and, and needs uh, first and foremost, and understand that those may change, that's okay. It's just they have to be reassessed. And communicate continuously. Um, this is something that uh, Jim and Leanne touched on as well. And again, when you sit down and start talking, mom and dad start talking to each other, uh, what, what tends to happen uh, is you bring in the other members of the family. And I think that this is good because nobody wants to be surprised by anything. In this type of situation, if you have heirs who are surprised, um, they, they had an expectation of you know, receiving something um, or participating in the business and they find out down the road they're not going to do that, you know, that's where seeds of discontent are sown and it can lead to problems within the family, particularly if the family dynamics aren't, uh, aren't great to begin with. Um, so when you start that communication process, you know, these things tend to come out and can be dealt with as you're going through the process. 
Um, there should be no surprise, uh, you know, at the end of this for anyone. If there is, again, it can lead to some issues. So what I want to do is talk a little bit about this blend between we've got estate planning and we've got transition planning. And essentially, when I think about estate planning, I think about giving what you have to those you want quickly, efficiently. Um, everybody wants to have minimal tax consequences and expenses and, and really leave the, the advantage or give the best advantage to um, their family. And so when we look at estate planning, typical documents are going to be things such as wills, trusts, power of attorney, health care directives. Wills and trusts are what I call distribution documents. These are documents that you put together now that discuss how your assets are to be distributed after you have passed. Okay, And even if you have uh, a farm transition in place and you have buy-sell agreements, and I'll get to that in a minute, you still want to have something in place that discusses what should happen in the event of your passing. It's important to consider who's in charge and where you want your assets to go. Now, the other piece of this is what I call disability documents, power of attorney, health care directive. These are documents you put in place now that actually are put in place so that you can be cared for financially and in terms of, of health care decisions if you're living and something happens to you. And these two documents, I think, are critical because they are easy to do. And if, if you think about this process as just taking small steps to get to a point where everything is, um, you know, streamlined and, and you have a plan, um, it may take a little longer to have discussions about ultimately how your assets will be distributed. But power of attorney and health care directive, I would just encourage people to get those done so you're covered. Um, okay, and what about using a trust to transfer asset? Okay, <laughs> I see that. Um, yes, you can use a trust to transfer assets, um, definitely. Okay, so now transition planning. Basically, in a transition plan, Think of it as creating, it's a process where you create an action plan, you have a timeline, and we put together documents that accomplish the transfer of ownership and management, okay, of a farm business to the next generation. We want it to be done in a manner that has been, you know, really controlled and thought out well in advance because we want to make sure that the, the future success of that farming business uh, is maintained um, to the best extent you can. And we also, again, want to make sure that we take into account the successful retirement of the current owner. Um, and in, in a transition plan, what we might see, typical documents are going to be written action plans and business plans. Uh, it's important to you know commit things to writing. It makes the process, it makes people stick with the process. And, and there's something about writing something down that we're more accountable to ourselves and others if we do that. But a business plan is important because you know you want to know when you begin a transition plan how healthy your farming business is. And you know that gives you an indication of you know how how you can bring somebody into that business to set them up for future success and you know what you can do as an exiting owner uh, in terms of your your capabilities in retirement and this should be done early on and it should be you know updated from time to time we also see the utilization of contracts leases purchase agreements bills of sale things that would transfer ownership of um, machinery, equipment, uh, and you know, land if that's desirable. Uh, when we have business entities, and the S Corp was talked about, that is one type of business entity that can be used and is used uh, for farming operations. But generally, business entities are going to have what we call operating agreements, um, and usually, operating agreements are put together immediately when a business is formed. 
Uh, and they may incorporate terms about when shares in that business can be bought or sold or what happens to shares when uh, the shareholder becomes disabled. Um, if the operating agreement is silent, a buy-sell agreement can be a standalone document. Okay, And in entities where mom and dad might be the, the you know, sole uh, shareholders, if a transition is happening to the next generation, then really I would encourage uh, the, the family to sit down and enter into a buy-sell agreement that works with the estate plan so that there's comprehensive coverage and the intent uh, is carried through. So those are typical documents that you know we would see for those types of plans. Now, in terms of uh, estate planning, common goals that I hear, and the reason I think there was a question as to the trust, um, is that avoiding intestacy, you, you want to have a will or a trust that basically governs what happens to your estate and it's on your terms. Um, if you have no plan, you have no will, or you have no trust, then essentially you have the estate plan that the state of Minnesota says you get. And in situations like this, that really never amounts to anything good um, because we know there are special considerations with a family farm business. And you won't get those uh, just relying on intestacy. Um, you know, there are plenty of reasons if we've got, if you've got minor children, uh, it's important to have plans. You also, in terms of nominating um, fiduciaries, this is key uh, because you want to think about someone who's trustworthy and someone you feel comfortable with kind of carrying the torch for you once you're gone. And the reality is in certain situations, in certain families, there is no family member that would be appropriate. Um, if you have uh, volatility in the family relationships, um, there are fiduciaries, there are businesses out there that serve as professional fiduciaries. And so those types of things need to be considered. Um, and then making bequests of assets. Here's where you get the opportunity to say that you're giving a certain piece of land or you're giving uh, certain shares in a business um, to a particular child or children. Uh, and so it's important to consider those things. Taxes, of course, everybody wants to uh, do what they can to minimize the taxes. Uh, and then, again, streamlining the process, avoiding probate. One thing that is a misconception out there is that if you have a will, you avoid probate. That's not true. Uh, a will is a ticket to probate. A will is your instructions to the court about what happens to your estate once you've passed. So if probate avoidance is something that people are looking for, that's where the, the utilization of trusts can come in. Um, Jim and Leanne mentioned uh, the life estate. Um, that is, it was a very popular um, mechanism to transfer real estate, um, particularly prior to 2003 in Minnesota. Um, the life estate was something that you set it up and you have two, two different types of owners, really. You have uh, something called a life tenant. That's the person who has the present interest to possess that property, stay on the property, collect rent from the property. And as soon as that life tenant dies, uh, the the title to the land automatically transfers to what we would call a remainderman. And this was very slick and it's it's still used today. The downside of this is that, you know, the, the reason things changed in 2003 was medical assistance rules changed. The life estate used to be used to essentially prevent the county um, from being able to attach a a claim or lien on the real estate if the life tenant had received me medical assistance. The loopholes for medical assistance are tightening up. Um, you know, they're tightening up all the time. Life estates do not avoid that any longer, but really what it comes down to is a claim could be filed on the life tenant's ownership interest. 
and we could spend you know another hour talking about life estates um, but what I'll leave you with is the downside to life estates is that if you have multiple children as remaindermen okay then realistically you have multiple people on title and they may or may not all get along and you don't really have one person who's in control of that property okay so that's the that's the downside now in terms of transition planning uh, really common goals protect the business leave a legacy um, do what we can to train in and get the next generation ready and of course keeping land in the family often is is a big one notice under both columns maintaining family harmony is always a goal uh, for for both of these categories okay um, I know we've got some questions here um, when it is appropriate please address the uninterested antagonistic air question okay so we're gonna get into that a little bit um, what I'll say here just to start is that when you have a transition process underway I recommend you start 10 to 15 years in advance of when you think that transition is going to be completed at least five years out um, and again the options that you will have will be greatly increased if you do so so when looking at things such as the antagonistic air question generally when I see it it's on farm airs and off farm airs and coming up with a way to treat them that uh, may be fair and as Jim said it doesn't have to be uh, you know it doesn't have to be equal fair and equal are not the same thing what I would recommend when we when we look at antagonistic heirs first of all I think mom and dad have to make it clear what the intent is from day one and that's why communication is so important the intent should be documented and it should be consistent um, in terms of trying to treat this antagonistic air fairly that's a personal decision that mom and dad will have to think about um, now Jim and Leanne want to treat their kids pretty fairly um, keep in mind it's it's your estate and you do not have to give anybody anything at any time uh, just because they would be uh, you know uninterested or antagonistic but generally speaking most parents do want to come up with a method where you know kids are treated somewhat fairly for off-farm heirs what that really means is sitting them down and pointing out what the intent is and looking at the contribution that an on-farm heir might have made there is certain uh, you know sweat equity is a form of capital and what I've seen some of my clients do is say you know we've decided that the value of our farm on the day that the on-farm heir entered into the picture uh, was X and that's the amount that we want to have distributed equally between our kids in some form now the contribution that the on-farm heir may make throughout the years we've seen the value of the farm you know double or triple since then and we don't think it's right that the off-farm heirs benefit from that sweat equity and so in terms of figuring out a number to work with that's one way of approaching it is, is sitting down and figuring out what did this on-farm heir contribute in terms of first of all any of their personal capital to the farming business and also what the value of their sweat equity would be now it can become very difficult uh, to you know try to keep things even in that sense um, if you're looking at straight dollar figures because that on-farm heir may have really contributed a lot to the business and again if you're firm in what your intent is and you communicate this and do so early on and consistently it's always going to be better there are options for off-farm heirs that um, that I know I have in here um, and I think it's a couple slides down um, are there sufficient assets and essentially one of the things and I can go back here um, the slide I have up right now basically communicate with the off-farm heirs 
use or leverage other types of assets if you can, um, in, including life insurance. Define benefit programs, which would be something like uh, you as a farm owner could set up a pension through the farm or a 401k through the farm. Um, if you have other cash assets or real estate, can those assets be earmarked for an off-farm heir? If so, then take a look at those things. Um, these are financial products, the life insurance setting up these 401ks. It may or may not be appropriate for your family, but it is an option. And um, if there's other real estate, a family cabin, something along those lines, then perhaps you want to uh, you know, establish that that is something that's earmarked for the off-farm heir. Um, you know, no, there's really not a law that says that heirs have to be treated fairly unless you don't plan. If you rely on state intestacy laws, then that's what's going to happen. But if you decide that that's not what's best for your family and you create provisions in a will or trust, then no, they don't have to be treated fairly. The problem arises when the off-farm heir believes or alleges that mom and dad didn't intend to cut him or her out. And that's, that's why it's important to start these conversations as soon as possible and make sure that you're consistent and that everybody understands what your intent is. Um, because the last thing you want is for an off-farm heir to allege that mom or dad didn't have capacity when they put their plan together because they waited so long. Uh, and certainly, had mom and dad had capacity, they would have included me equally. If that's not the intent, it has to be clear. Okay, I know I'm creeping up here um, on my time, and I'll kind of shoot through these things. Um, and, and Steve, do, does everybody have access to this PowerPoint when we're finished? Yeah, it will have. Uh, we can have this in a PDF form on the website, and then also this recording too. Okay, yeah, that would be great. Okay. Um, yep, and so essentially what I have up right now, everybody should have a voice. Some should speak <laughs> more. Some, sh some should speak a little bit louder than others. Mom and dad must drive the decisions. Uh, and again, on-farm heirs have to be involved. It's critical um, to have conversations with them because part of what you want to know is who has an interest in this business. And sometimes uh, the older generation might have a preconceived notion of what they believe should happen based on what they have interpreted as interest from the family. And they may or may not be correct. So these questions should be asked. Um, and ideally, you know, the process would look like if you have an on-farm heir, um, defining what that working relationship looks like. And, you know, really setting things up in, in perhaps even stages where you've got a trial run you put together. There's no transfer of asset ownership that happens. Mom and dad own everything. But you really are testing out whether or not this uh, younger generation is ready um, to begin engaging in this type of operation. And basically you hire them on and pay them, you know, pay them to work on the farm and they contribute to the business, but mom and dad still own everything. And if things work out, great. You can move on to an intermediate phase. If things don't work and both parties or one or both parties say, we gave it a shot, but clearly that's not, uh, you know, that's not the ideal situation. At least you have an idea and you haven't engaged in any transfers of anything. Um, intermediate phases, essentially what you're looking to do is you're looking to get that next generation um, you know, more, uh, more involved. And you know, mom and dad still own the assets, but you may have that next generation deciding to kind of go out on their own. They're, they're a little bit separate from mom and dad, but you know, they might be renting land. They might be um, utilizing some of mom and dad's machinery, but they may do it in a structured way that you know they're compensated uh, sweat equity wise and, and so they get to use those things and then getting those heirs more involved with the day-to-day -day management of the farm is is critical because at some point you want to see that next generation succeed and be able to take the reins and do so seamlessly 
And you know, moving forward from that, if that intermediate phase works, then you know, really, as long as mom and dad are at a point where they're comfortable and can do this from a financial perspective, then we might be ready to talk about transitioning ownership of some components of the farming business. Um, and there we get into starting uh, to forming business entities with that on-farm heir. And I, what I want to go back to is there was a question about gifting. And what I'm going to say here is that Jim was correct in this, in the, um, there's kind of a one-two punch here. And Jim was correct in saying that there is really little danger uh, for most Americans uh, about kind of running aground of the gift tax um, rules in the sense that this year each of us has $5.49 million that we can pass to anybody that we want to at the federal level without incurring a state tax. Now the gift tax plays in to that number and dollar for dollar chips away at that. But for most people, they're pretty safe. They're not gonna they're not gonna hit up against that 5.49. Um, if you own a lot of land that has a high value to it, you do have to keep that in mind, however. Uh, and if your business is you know is is quite lucrative, then it's an issue. But Minnesota and the states, the other states, um, have their own form of gift tax, and, and this really needs to be considered depending on where you live. Minnesota got rid of our gift tax, and so here in Minnesota, you know, generally gift away. If if you're not bumping up to the state level because we don't have one and you're far enough away from the federal level, great. But here's the downside. That's gift tax. We also want to keep in mind capital gains taxes. And when you gift land or you gift any appreciable asset, you are gifting it to someone and you're giving them your basis in that asset. So for land, you know, whatever you purchased that land, whatever the price per acre was when you bought it, that now becomes that gift recipient's basis. If you've got an on-farm heir that doesn't ever plan on selling that land, that may work out beautifully well. Because when they pass, provided things don't change significantly, um, they will get a step up in basis. But keep in mind that if they don't, want to hold the land and they do plan on selling it you have to do that math because it, it may actually be detrimental for for gifting something like that to an off-farm heir that has no interest in and they're going to turn around and sell it um, so that's something to really consider um, and so again anytime we're forming businesses we're gifting we want to be very mindful of, of things such as taxes um, in Minnesota and other jurisdictions, when we form a business entity, um, we have to be very careful about whether we put title to the land in that business entity because most states will have something called a corporate farm law. And the corporate farm laws generally, the policy is we don't want large corporate entities to come in and take over and push the family farm unit out. But it also means that we have to live with the rules in terms of who can be part of that business. And for that reason, oftentimes what, what I will advise clients to do is if they want to start a farming uh, entity, it should be done for the business itself, but land ownership might still remain in you know, mom and dad's individual names or you know, in something like a general partnership arrangement um, you know, versus putting it into an entity. And um, you know, S-Corps were mentioned earlier. Uh, you know, S corps are great for having only one level of taxation. C corps used to be very popular for farm uh, for farm operations about 40 years ago. Um, C corps have double taxation, meaning you're taxed at the corporate level, and then when a distribution is made to shareholders, the shareholders are taxed. Um, if you have land that's currently owned by a C corp. I would encourage you to talk to uh, a professional CPA, tax attorney, someone who can review that strategy with you under current law uh, because you can convert. You can convert from a C-Corp to an S-Corp. Um, setting up an LLC. Yes, LLCs have become very popular. They are similar in the sense uh, to an S-Corp that they are what we call a pass-through entity, meaning that there's one level of tax. 
Um, any of these entities are desirable because they afford you personal asset uh, protection from liability. And so they're, they're great tools, um, but you know, again, they have to be right for you. And um, the advantages and disadvantages of, e of each type of entity you'll want to look at before you do that. But setting up an LLC, that's become very, very popular. Um, essentially, you get the personal asset, you know, protection, but you know it's a pass-through entity, so uh, it's it's a it's a nice form of ownership. And in that LLC, uh, we don't really f refer to it as stock or shares, but more so units. But it functions in in a similar fashion. Um, LLCs, you can have what we call a manager-managed LLC or a member-managed LLC. So um, if you do have mom and dad transferring units in that, that business entity over to the next generation, you might have that, that be a manager-managed LLC because mom and dad retain control uh, until they're ready to turn the reins over. Um, so good question. Um, can you donate the farm to a nonprofit organization if the heirs are not interested or antagonistic? You can, but you have to be very careful and work with that nonprofit to determine whether or not they even have an interest because what can happen is, again, they're going to be under the same rules for corporate farm laws and also um, they, they really, nonprofits aren't used to paying taxes. And if they are running the farm, you know, if they're doing anything that would uh, essentially be taking them into a, you know, they're running a different form of business other than their nonprofit, they can end up uh, running aground and paying tax on, on that. Um, so you'll have to really talk to that nonprofit. Um, usually when they receive farm land, um, the inclination is to turn around and sell it because the cash is actually something that's more useful for them. Um, but from a tax perspective, even annual income taxes, if you're charitably inclined, I mean, you can give you know truckloads of grain to a nonprofit. Just know that you know usually they turn around and um, and will sell those assets, particularly if it's going to require them to manage the assets in a way that would put them in an undesirable position tax-wise. Um, Anything different when all heirs are off the farm, farm in question being rented currently? Um, so this is, this is something that I see frequently um, or more frequently if we don't have you know, an on-farm heir who wants to take the farm over. Um, you really have to ask yourself what your goals are for that farm. You know, is this something that you, you want to keep um, in the family, you want it to be a source of income for the children, potentially grandchildren, then you might consider putting some putting the land into a trust um, with provisions that require the trustee to hold the title to the land and pay the, the income, you know, the net income out to the beneficiaries. Um, I have had clients who said from a philosophical standpoint, if they have strong feelings about conservation or strong feelings about uh, the way that their farm be managed in the future, and they they love the person who's renting their land, um, they may decide that uh, selling the farm to that that neighbor or that renter is completely appropriate. But what again, I would caution is that you, we have to be aware of of any uh, capital gains taxes. And sometimes what you might choose to do then is say, you know we're going to hold the the title to the land until we pass our estate gets a step up in basis and we're then going to direct that our personal representative or executor or trustee then sell the land to someone that we may have arranged, uh, they may have an option, they may have an option to buy. And so those things can be considered um, and frequently are. And I think I've gone, uh, <laughs> yes, I'm accepting new clients. <laughs> Um, but uh, I think I've gone way over my time here, and um, I'm glad that we have gotten through most of this. I just want to recap. Please start early. Um, know that there are a ton of options, and and part of it is is going through and deciding what's best for you and your family. Planning in a crisis is never a good idea, 
And so get started now and don't get frustrated. Um, know that you do have options and it really comes down to what's best for you and your family. Um, but again, define the goals and the needs. I will ask my clients when they come in if they've done that because it makes the process more efficient and I appreciate it um, greatly when they can come to me and say they've put some time and thought into the process. Um, and as Jim and Leanne said and I've said, constant communication is really critical. So hopefully this was helpful to you guys. Um, if there's any issue with uh, the PowerPoint, please let me know. I'm happy to, to send that out via email to anybody that wants it. Excellent. Thank you so much, Rachel. There was just a ton of information in there. And yeah, and we'll, we'll get this uh, presentation put into a PDF format and put it on our website when we have this recording archived as well, so people can go, out, go back and check that out. Um, and Rachel, remind me, is it true that are you going to be at our Practical Farmers of Iowa conference this winter talking? Yeah, I will yeah. in January. That's what I thought, yep. yeah. So those of you in Iowa or, or um, who might be available January 19th and 20th, come join us at the conference. We'll have more farm transfer conversations. Um, so we've got some more time for questions here, and I wanted to see if Jim and Leanne could come back in. And there are two questions uh, specifically for them about um, putting a value on sweat equity. And uh, Teresa had asked how you figured out the sweat, sweat equity for your on-farm air. And then there was just another question about that as well. Is that something you can talk about quick? Yeah, uh, we can talk about it quick. We have uh, put no uh, very great uh, mental work into it. Uh, it would be uh, sweat equity that we offer our, uh, our uh, son and partner, uh, partner now, uh, at the time of the hog price meltdown, was basically a, um, a reaction to an emergency. I mean, we, we needed to do something to take care of each other, and we did. Uh, and and that, that's basically what, what happened there. And, and as it turned out, you know, without adding up the number of hours worked or, or any of that, um, uh, we, uh, we were able to accomplish some of, uh, of uh, uh, we were able to accomplish some of what we wanted to try uh, to do in terms of our transition when we got to the transition because we were actually transferring uh, assets in, instead of just uh, writing a paycheck. Uh, now, uh, figuring sweat equity uh, is, is generally thought of that way. Uh, you know, how many hours of work or how much time and attention as somebody put in, and how much is that worth in terms of, of, uh, 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 of gaining a portion of the farm. Uh, but in any case, that's how close we came to that. One of the things that uh, is possibly a little, a little different for us, too, uh, and this was very deliberate, too. Our, our son uh, is the oldest in the family, and uh, we made a conscious decision um, and it almost didn't work out. It almost blew up on us. But we made a conscious decision at, at, when, at age 50 that that was, kind of a, that was kind of a time. If we were going to actually transition the next generation in, they needed to be with us by the time we were 50 or very shortly thereafter. Uh, that there, It was no time to, uh, to talk about uh, 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 an heir working in when we're 75. Uh, and, and so we were very strong on that. And that's why we invited our son and his family to join us. And, of course, he did want to join us. And, and that's kind of a natural aspect of, of uh, the difference in our ages being as how he's uh, the oldest in our family. Uh, uh, there are fewer years between him uh, and uh, our age than there are between his sisters and us. Um, I, that's not much of an answer probably to some of the questions. Um, but um, uh, uh, about sweat equity, that's about as close as we came to it, though. Great. Yeah, thank you, Jim. Um, and also, Jim and Leanne, if there were any questions that, um, that came up in your mind while listening to Rachel, that this is a good opportunity for you to ask those as well, and vice versa. Um, we do have a few more minutes if anybody else wants to put something in the chat box for any of our presenters here. Uh, I'll just ask, uh, I'll ask Rachel, uh, 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 on the capital gains, I think I know the answer to this, but I want it confirmed. Uh, so I'm asking you, on the capital gains, uh, what's the difference between how that number is set uh, on, uh, on gifted property, 
compared to property transferred by will? That's a great question. Um, so any time that somebody makes a gift of, of that property, uh, you're doing that at your basis, okay, your cost basis. And what cost basis essentially means is if you bought that land, it's the price per acre you purchased it for. If you inherited that land, it was the value on the date of death of the person that, that you inherited it from, okay? Uh, and so when you make a gift, a lifetime gift of that land to someone else, you are gifting them your basis. Now, the alternative to that was, as you mentioned, passing it through a will or a trust. If you own that property when you die, then the individuals that you give it to through your will or your trust, uh, a revocable living trust, they, they get that land at a step up in basis, meaning that the land is valued on your date of death. And so generally because land appreciates over time, you know, we might expect to see that, uh, you know, that's, a, that's at a higher price point. Um, and so, again, if you, if you know that you will not have any on-farm heirs and that your kids are going to receive this land from you and they're likely going to sell it, then you have to consider that because um, it, it just is a numbers game. You know, if, if people want a gift to avoid estate tax, well, you know, in Minnesota, estate tax might max out at a 16% uh, rate, and um, capital gains taxes are going to be higher than that. Um, Long-term capital gains taxes are going to be higher than that. So, you know, you really have to sit down and consider those consequences. Thank you. You are welcome. Yeah, great answer. Um, it looks like, yeah, maybe we've got time for just this last question, and, and it looks like it's for Jim and Leanne. And he's asking, did you just figure out how mu did you just figure out how much the value of the farm had increased during your son's tenure, and then increase his share accordingly? No, uh, no, we did not. Um, uh, as I pointed out, uh, one of the complications to that for us is that uh, we have uh, been working basically uh, the last twenty years. Uh, with just as much uh, strength and dedication as we did the 20 years before that. So, in other words, it, it's not it's not a situation where we're staying in the house and he's operating the farm. Uh, what we're trying to do is to get him into operations and to get him into an ownership role as far as the land goes. Because what we've seen is that uh, is that that land game basically in farming is everything. If if you if if, if you have your land bought. Uh, at a price that allows you some maneuvering room in terms of, of, of the finances later on, um, you, you have an ongoing advantage that you, you, if, if you, unless you make a major mistake, you're probably not going to lose. Uh, there's a very real difference between the, the farmer who buys uh, the first quarter of land uh, at, uh, at, say, uh, uh, $8,000 an acre and the farmer that was able to buy the first quarter of land at $1,500 an acre. Uh, and, 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 and so we considered that that was really the most important thing that we could do. Uh, and, and so uh, we, didn't, uh, we didn't calculate the value of the farm as he came in and, 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 the, uh, and the value of it at the time we did this transfer. Uh, interesting uh, little addition to that, if we had done that, <clears throat> because, excuse me, because of the uh, way the markets ran, uh, the first thing the value of the farm would have done after he started, they started farming, would have been to nosedive, uh, because anytime you're, uh, you're, you know, you're putting uh, 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 feed into a hog that's only worth eight cents a pound, uh, uh, um, uh, you're bleeding to death basically, and that's what happened to us. So, uh, uh, so, you know, I mean, everybody is different, and everything is different. We just didn't see the need of it. Um, because uh, uh, we were satisfied that we were partnering forward in the thing, and and um, and we wanted to make sure that we gave him, if we could, you know, uh, as good a position as we could as far as the equity part of it went. Good, thank you, Jim. 
Um, yeah, so that pretty much brings us to the end of our time tonight. And, and it looks like we've exhausted the questions in the chat box, so that works out. Um, uh, big thanks to our speakers tonight. There's tons of good information in here. Um, if anybody's tuning in, they can come back and revisit this on our archives later uh, or share it with anybody in your family that you think should also, also watch this. So um, again, thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Jim and Leanne, for taking the time to share your insight with us tonight. This is a great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is great.